There's a there's a bell over there that Seth is gonna. Yeah, I'm gonna I'm gonna ring it. Are you out of time? Hey everybody, uh, I'm Seth Koenig and we are going to introduce our panel here uh, in a moment. Um, we're just pulling up all of the stuff. Now I know uh, we are supposed to do certain things that every chess session is supposed to do. Of course, I have forgotten what that is. Uh, also, I have forgotten what the number is of this session, which she is going to tell me hopefully momentarily, but this is a POCUS crossfire. I will tell you what this is because that I do know. Uh, it's gl I'm glad to see everybody. We're trying to, obviously, the world has been saturated by ultrasonography and ultrasonography talks and ultrasonography this and ultrasonography that. So uh, we are trying to figure out more unique ways to challenge folks to understand both how the panel here may use ultrasonography, but then more importantly, to see what folks out, in, uh, out here are doing with ultrasonography and sort of share some of the things that we think about, which is probably uh, similar to some of the things that you think about. And so what we're going to do is with our panel, and I'm going to let uh, Dr. Uh, Amik Sodi come up here and actually say hello to everybody, but she was doing something. What we're going to do is we have three or four topics that are probably of pretty great, great concern to all of us as both pulmonary and critical care folks. And we are going to show um, sort of how maybe each of the specialists here might view the ultrasound in the context of a case. And then we might want to know sort of what you guys are thinking and challenging us. And uh, she and I, as moderators, you know, might chime in a little bit and give our two cents to our three panelists as to whether we think it's a bunch of <clears throat> or whether we actually believe what they're saying. And so we'd like this to be sort of a, a really fun, interactive way. And again, I, I stress the idea that um, without participation, things are just simple lectures. And so hopefully people will enjoy some of the commentary and may have some of the commentary on their own. And with that, I'd like to introduce uh, the person who put this together, and we're grateful for that. Thank you. Well, welcome. Uh, I'm glad you all took some time out and come spend some time with us. Um, my name is Amik Sodhi, and I'm from the University of Wisconsin. And along with uh, Seth, I'm going to be moderating this debate. Uh, so we'll introduce you to our three expert faculty here. Uh, we have Dr. Navita Ramesh. Uh, she's the Critical Care Program Director from UPMC Harrisburg. We have Dr. Ibrahim El Husseini, who's a pulmonary critical care physician from Robert Wood Johnson Medical School in New Jersey. And we have Dr. Jonathan Greenstein, uh, who's an associate professor of medicine uh, from, uh, and I have to look at my notes, uh, from- the, uh, the best medical school in New Jersey. <laughs> Excellent. Rutgers, New Jersey Medical School in Newark. <laughs> Wonderful. I thought it was a Lego, Lego <laughs> university. <I don't> know. <laughs> All right, so the way that this is going to work is um, we're going to introduce a case, uh, something that's common that uh, questions come up oftentimes at the, at the bedside, and uh, then ask our panelists to chime in and uh, have you chime in and, and see what you think about this. Um, really, this is made better by your participation and uh, by your comments, so please feel free to ask questions uh, and any comments that you might have. All we ask is everyone just be courteous and respectful to each other. All right, Seth, would you like to start? Sure. sure. All right, so uh, everybody can recognize a abnormal chest x-ray uh, sort of like this, and everybody has this same patient that comes in, right? So this is a 55-year-old with a history of congestive heart failure and presents with uh, shortness of breath, worsening, 
uh, over one week. And, you know, clearly the chest radiograph isn't normal, but it may not be so abnormal as to know exactly uh, what is going on. And so I think we, uh, we have um, some ultrasounds that we have performed because you are at a POCUS uh, uh, session. Uh, this isn't a CT session. So therefore, the individual who went to see this patient said to themselves, okay, I have a patient with some cardiopulmonary issues, right? Shortness of breath in a patient who has a history of heart failure. And so the individual did, uh, hopefully most people are familiar with, you know, basic echo. And I think everybody would, could recognize, let me see if this thing actually uh, works. Let's see. Oh, it does. So this is the left ventricle here, the right ventricle here. You have the aortic outflow track. And right there is going to be your mitral uh, valve and left atrium. And I think most people would, would agree once you've done this long enough that this is, you know, severe left ventricular or moderate to severe left ventricular dysfunction. So we've got that, which goes along with the history. But here's the crux and here's what we're going to ask our panelists to decide, which is then we say we need to do a lung ultrasonography because the main complaint was shortness of breath. And I think that um, it's listed here. This is our left anterior chest. And I think, you know, people who are going to start to look at lung ultrasonography a little bit more deeply would recognize that, first of all, it's a vascular probe, so we're getting much more close than with a phased array. There are beelines everywhere. So we have a pulmonary edema pattern in this area that we're looking, and there's also a small pleural effusion here. But what we also see is a very irregular pleural line. So we have an irregular pleural line with beelines and a, and a pleural effusion that's sitting up top. And then if we look at the right side, it's sort of similar, except that there's maybe less pleural fluid. So again, very, very irregular pleural line, beelines everywhere in an individual who's short of breath with a history of congestive heart failure. So that's the case. And from here, we can move on to the question. Sure. So I think I'm going to ask uh, Dr. Ramesh uh, what her approach would be to this patient. Um, and what she thinks about, uh, you know, is this cardiogenic pulmonary edema or is this non-cardiogenic or can we not say one way or the other? Thank you, Dr. Sodi. Um, so yeah, this is a very common clinical scenario that we all encounter. I think um, when you look at the echo itself, the point of care ultrasound of the heart, that as Dr. Um, Koenig mentioned, the left ventricle is not functioning well. So if you were to stop just there and say, okay, LV function is reduced, this is cardiogenic pulmonary edema. But I think this, whoever did this um, focus went a step further, which I have to appreciate them, and they did the lung ultrasound. And again, in lung ultrasound, I, I kind of consider it um, very, very underutilized. Lung ultrasound, when you look at the images closely, if you could just bring up one of the clips, please. The first step is uh, looking at the pleural line. Is the pleural line smooth, homogenous, or it's irregular and thickened appearance? So that gives us a clue. Is it a hydrostatic phenomenon? Is it an inflammatory phenomenon? What's going on with the patient, right? And then you look at something, the B lines, which is basically the alveolar uh, interstitial pattern, where, which basically means the alveolum and the interstitium are getting filled with something, and the alveoli, there's, not, there's no air in there. There's something else within the alveoli. So to differentiate between cardiogenic and non-cardiogenic pulmonary, uh, pulmonary edema, these two points are important. How does the pleural line look, and what's the interstitial pattern? If you think about um, if it's an inflammatory state, there is some, some areas where the lung is spared and some areas the lung is not spared, as opposed to pulmonary edema, where it's a diffuse phenomenon, homogenous. So you see some areas of sparing with normal lung with abnormal uh, pleural line. And... Um, the interstitial pattern, too, is going to be diffuse, not just posteriorly. It's going to be everywhere. Right. So those are the main points that I use to differentiate the cardiogenic versus non-cardiogenic. And mm -hmm. then uh, this study, based on this study, basically looked at the same question. This interstitial pattern is present in both pulmonary edema due to cardiac reason and non-cardiogenic pulmonary edema, too. Plural line abnormalities are mainly seen in the first phenomenon, which is ARDS, or the non-cardiogenic pulmonary edema. Reduction of lung sliding, which is basically the parietal and the visceral pleura sliding against each other, it's seen more in the inflammatory phenomenon, which, is, which could be non-cardiogenic pulmonary edema. Spared areas, which is normal lung, 
with abnormal, uh, normal pleural line with abnormal. So normal lung next to abnormal lung. So that's the, called the spared area, so the spared regions in the lung. Consolidation, which is basically hepatization of the lung, where the lung looks like the liver, and that's seen mostly in non-cardiogenic pulmonary edema or in pneumonia. Pleural effusions could be in either uh, situations, but it's more with cardiogenic pulmonary edema. And the lung pulse is also seen more with um, non-cardiogenic pulmonary edema. Right. Okay. Okay. So, you know, I think uh, Dr. Ramesh laid out a, a bunch of different things that potentially could help you differentiate. Um, so I'm going to ask her, uh, her colleague, Dr. Al Husseini, um, you know, what his thoughts are, what his approach is. Is it sort of similar? Um, does he have something else that he looks at as well uh, in conjunction that can help him make this diagnosis? Okay, thank you. Uh, so essentially the approach uh, that I usually do is Would something you like similar. Me to, do you need the next slide? Uh, you not wait? yet. Okay. Yeah, yeah. Uh, so um, occasionally you might have a patient where you cannot really see how smooth or not smooth the pleural line is. And uh, there was a study published recently in CHEST that uh, looked at utilizing the M mode uh, essentially using a linear probe or a vascular probe. And by looking at the pleural line under M mode and see how continuous or not continuous that pleural line is, you'll be able to differentiate between cardiogenic pulmonary edema or uh, inter acute and in alveolar interstitial syndrome from uh, inflammatory diseases. Uh, so um, in that study, uh, there's a couple of examples in the next slide where they look at, you know, you can see here clearly uh, a continuous pleural line in the uh, first image, and that's uh, normal subjects. You, there's no B lines in that uh, image per se. And then in the next image, you see a fragmented pleural line, which is usually seen uh, in non-cardiogenic pulmonary edema. So that's something that I occasionally add uh, to the exam uh, mentioned earlier by Navita. So I would just like to know, though, then, why, did, why is it that some people with acute pulmonary edema might get pink frothy sputum? You don't think that the pleural line gets uh, diseased in a state like that, necessarily? Well, a pink frothy sputum? Yeah. Uh, I mean, usually it's from increased uh, capillary, pulmonary capillary pressures. and uh, Right, so my job is to the be the jerk up on stage, <laughs> and my job is to remind everybody as the panelists are going through things in a very logical and, and good way that um, our complexity, right, is that nothing is always 100% one way or the other. And, you know, folks who develop acute pulmonary edema, pink frothy sputum, mitral disease may have fever, white count, and it's all cardiogenic pulmonary edema. So I just want to, you know, add that into the flavor there. Uh, do you want me to go to the next slide? Uh, sure. Or is that? I think... This is uh, a third pattern that you may sometimes see also utilizing M mode and looking at the pleural line. And this is uh, a sinusoidal pleural line that you may see if there's a pleural effusion uh, present. And this also points potentially towards a uh, cardiogenic pulmonary edema as the cause for the B lines. So you're saying that all you would do is M mode? Uh, sometimes. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so. Uh Dr. Greenstein, uh, what do you think? Uh, you know, what is your approach, and is there something that you would add on to this? So I think my colleagues are, are giving really good information about the complexity of the question that we're trying to answer. Um, and I would just stress that when I'm trying to figure this out, I'm not just doing scan lines midclavicular down the anterior chest. I'm doing a lot of scan lines, and I'm sitting that patient up with the help of a nurse or rolling them onto their side, and I'm looking posteriorly, and I'm really trying to create a 3D map in my mind of what I'm seeing where so I can try to figure this out. Because as Seth said, um, different things can present in wildly different ways. So I, I would go to the time of the pandemic when I was getting really irritated by a lot of lung ultrasound articles that were coming out, and people were claiming that they could say this or that by looking at the lung ultrasound. And my stance was, that non-COVID ARDS and COVID ARDS look identical, and I can't tell the difference between the two, and that sometimes it's quite challenging to tell the difference between cardiogenic and non-cardiogenic pulmonary edema, even knowing these things that have been out in the literature for a while. Um, so I was pretty blown away uh, when Rob Artfeld out of uh, London, Ontario, um, came out with a paper, we can, I think go to this slide here, where he used uh, complex neural networks, artificial intelligence to, to figure this out. Um, and so he used a deep learning model, and, and I hope this is going to be the future, that in not too distant future, our ultrasound machines are going are to give us this information. 
But if you look at these uh, graphs here, you got COVID, non-COVID, and then hydrostatic pulmonary edema. And what you're seeing is that the um, neural network, which is in blue and in yellow, has uh, area under the curve that's close to one. And just to remind everybody, when you're looking at a good test, you're looking for a high sensitivity, high specificity, and the closer to one your area under the curve is, then the closer you are to a perfect test. And compared to the physicians that were looking at the lung ultrasounds, uh, where it's a little bit better than a coin toss, we gotta give the clinicians um, some credit here, uh, the neural network figures it out almost perfectly. Um, if we go to the next slide, um, and this kind of comes back to my colleagues' points and what they look at. This is a heat map, right, with, uh, with neural networks and AI. You don't really know what the heck the neural network is doing. You spit in information, it spits it out, and then there's this black box. Um, and what Arnfeld did is he went into the black box and generated these heat maps asking the neural network, well, where was the information that was really driving your decisions on your answers? And this should look kind of familiar. It's the plural line area. It's within a centimeter or so of the plural line where most of the decisions are being made by the neural network. Um, so certainly, uh, my colleagues are on something that we gotta look at it. Um, but I'm gonna take the stance that it's, it's really hard, and so I put myself probably with like a 70% uh, correct response rate when I'm looking. Yeah, so I guess what we're saying is we still a lot of times give steroids and furosemide and antibiotics and heparin at the yeah. same time. Is that the... Uh, Don't forget Zosin. Don't, okay, gotcha. <laughs> Uh, so I guess let me ask uh, the three of you here, um, are there maybe additional things uh, that could be helpful? Is there other, other than lung ultrasound, are there other modalities that maybe can help you uh, in some of this, this decision making, recognizing that none of it is 100%, but is there something that can potentially help? I mean, I, I would add if you go, you know, that echo, you're gonna have elevated left atrial pressures based on just the 2D image, so that will steer you more towards a hydrostatic picture, but it could be either or. Yeah, I agree, and sometimes the presence of bilateral pleural effusions, maybe more on the left, uh, could point towards a cardiogenic pulmonary edema. Obviously, it's not 100% specific. And then where does our clinical um, sort of feeling and, and what we think clinically is going on with these patients fit into all of this? I mean, essentially, ultrasound exams are, should not, we should not just make a diagnosis based on one single image and how a plural line looks like. We should always put everything into context from, you know, history probably is extremely important, lab, and see if it makes sense, essentially. Great. Anything else that anyone from the panel no. would like to add? Seth, you have uh, some? I'm, no, I'm, I mean, I'm, I'm kind of curious if uh, we have a moment to see if anybody yeah. out in the audience would like to add uh, sort of their opinion. We have a microphone there, or you could shout it out, although probably better with the mic because I think this is being recorded. Ariel, do you have anything to say? Yeah, I mean. Yeah, I mean, I think obviously we talk about this a lot and uh, we talk about like potentially oversimplifying this problem. Yeah, no one sees smooth B line, the uh, smooth pattern ever. Everyone has something else going on with them, some kind of chronic lung disease some kind of, I was in the hospital for a week, so I have atelectasis already, so it's not smooth. I think one of the key things that I would do in a patient like this is look at the previous echo that the patient had on a previous hospitalization and see, is this the patient's chronic state or is this a difference than the patient's chronic state, which would add a lot to right. the patient information or the scenario information. I, I think um, you know, everybody recognizes that the, the diagnosis of ARDS changed not, you know, not that long ago, and, and, it, and that's because it used to say that you know, this was a pulmonary edema pattern with normal left atrial pressures or wedge pressures, and we changed that definition to say predominantly not left-sided heart failure. And I think that that's, that's a key thing that we, re, that we need to remember that um, unfortunately very sick people sometimes have more than one thing going on. On the flip side, and I'm sure many people on the panel and out here recognize we were drying people out if we just use lung ultrasound in COVID because everybody in COVID had B lines. And if you weren't understanding what the panel said, which is that clearly COVID is gonna give you lumpy, bumpy, different places here and there. We were just drying people out because everybody said there were beelines. Does anybody else have any questions or we'll move on to the next case? But I really would like to hear 
people's opinions. Does anybody out there think this is just a bunch of crap and we should just be doing a CAT scan on the patient and a, and a right and left heart cath on, on all these people? Um, because this is, what, this is what drives our, our ability to take care of patients is to listen to folks and their different opinions. So maybe you'll get less shy as we go on to the next case. You want to take okay, this one? Yeah. All right, so um, our second case, also a familiar situation in the ICU. Um, you have a 60-year-old male transferred to the ICU from the floor. He was admitted a day back with fevers, cough, shortness of breath, diagnosed with community-acquired pneumonia. He decompensates and uh, requires intubation and is now in profound shock, requiring multiple pressors. He received one liter of whatever fluid of choice you want to give him uh, about an hour back. So my question to uh, Dr. El Husseini is, how would you approach this patient? Um, what would your next steps be to decide if you would like to give more volume, not give volume, or do something completely different? Okay, so thank you for the question. So um, essentially the way I approach this is I ask myself the question, if I give volume to this patient, am I gonna improve hemodynamics? And what I mean by that, increase cardiac output to improve oxygen delivery. And uh, to answer that question, the first statement that I make is, you know, preload is not equal to uh, volume responsiveness or uh, preload responsiveness. And uh, there's a couple ways, or there's a multiple ways to answer that question. My favorite way is to uh, do a passive leg raise test. And uh, by doing this, uh, obviously, if there's no contraindications, like there's no increased intra-abdominal pressure or increased intra-cerebral pressure, and obviously, if you had a patient with uh, no limb loss or pelvic fractures or anything like that, you would be um, giving the patient uh, roughly around 500 cc's of their own uh, blood. And while continuously uh, monitoring their cardiac output, uh, and if you want to do it non-invasively by looking at the LVOT VTI, since we know that the uh, LVOT diameter uh, would stay the same in the same individual, uh, if we see an increase in the signal uh, in the LVOT VTI, then we can assume that uh, the patient will probably be uh, volume responsive. Uh, so that's one way uh, I would approach it. Obviously, you have to be very careful and know how to do the passive leg raise test uh, because there's caveats to it. And uh, the uh, echo assessment should happen in real time because the changes in the LVOT VTI signal happen very quickly in these patients. Okay. C could so I, could I ask the audience a question? Ahead. How many out there have actually done a passive leg raising maneuver? Not on yourself. <laughs> <laughs> you really have done this and, and, and you have found that you're, you're capable of, of doing this repeatedly on the same patients? No, no, not at all. <laughs> well, maybe when we're done with this, we can um, have somebody come up and, uh, oh, and, and see what they say because I don't know, I asked the magic eight ball. I, I find it very difficult to raise the legs and to keep, maybe my echo skills are just not that good. But uh, you're shaking your head. You don't do this, right, Ari? Yeah, all right, I'm curious. We'll okay, so I think, I, I think before we get to the, the audience, and, and I, I assure you we will get to your opinions. Um, Dr. Al Husseini, did you want to finish yeah. your uh, thing? And, and occasionally, if, um, if you have the right patient, uh, you might be able to look for pulse pressure variation if you do not have an A-line. And if the patient meets certain specific criteria, which is usually is true in the OR, not necessarily true most of the time in the ICU. Um, there have been a, you know, some studies that looked at the uh, signal from the brachial artery uh, using a pulsed wave Doppler and correlating that to the signal from an arterial line to look for pulse pressure variation. This is relatively an, an easier thing to, uh, to measure compared to the uh, LVOT VTI, but comes with a lot of limitations. And you know the patient has to be passive on the vent, they need to be on HCC per kg, uh, no arrhythmias, no ARDS, and no increased intra-abdominal uh, pressure. You mean so. practically nobody. So it's around 6% of patients <laughs> okay. in the ICU, yeah. Okay. okay, so sounds like, so, you know, like you've laid out, there's a lot of limitations, right? So I'm going to ask Dr. Greenstein, um, you know, what his approach is. And with all these limitations in place, um, how do we approach this? Because this is truly a real-world problem we face every single day. 
So if I had the answer, I wouldn't be sitting here. Uh, that's number one. But um, I'm in the same camp as uh, Dr. Koenig that the passive leg raise, um, while I find it easy to raise their legs, um, I find it quite challenging to maintain the exact same angle of incination so that my Doppler angle isn't changing. And so that when I'm looking for that 10% or 12% or whatever paper you're following change, I can be confident that it's from the passive leg raise and not from my probe being slightly off. So it is doable, um, but in a lot of patients, it's really challenging. So to, to, to use that as my, as my routine way of doing things um, wouldn't work. Um, I trained when IVC was the holy grail with the, the 2004 paper by Barbier and Faisal that everybody was waving around and using to make decisions. And then over the course of my training and then career as an attending so far, I've just seen it be brought down the rungs of the ladder to the point where there's very little utility. So I think I have a slide with um, a paper that uh, Vignon published recently in 2017. Um, and uh, for those of you maybe not familiar, um, Philippe Vignon and Antoine Vieira-Baron are really giants in the field of uh, heart-lung interactions, and they're, they're expert sonographers in France. Um, and if you compare this receiver operator curve to the ones that I showed you from the convoluted neural network, you'll see it doesn't look very good. Um, and these are all of these parameters that we were holding up pretty high over the years. So you'll see uh, delta IVC area under the curve is 0.65, um, SVC, um, which we do use, 0.74, uh, looking at the delta V max, 0.72, and pulse pressure variation, you know, 0.65. So you're better than a coin toss, um, but you're certainly not a lot better off. So I've turned into um, a pretty pessimistic clinician when it comes to this, and so I actually think of it more from Will they tolerate me testing the theory? Because I'm not sure based on my parameters. And so I'll look at the lungs um, and I'll see if they seem like they're dry and A-lines and half a liter might not hurt them and, and see. But I don't know, most patients, by the time they come to the medical ICU, have gotten many liters of fluid elsewhere. So the idea that more is going to benefit is already not that plausible. Should, should we be using the um, CVP again? The nurses in the ICU know not to even transduce it when the central line is in, which is not that often. Okay, so I think uh, Dr. Greenstein talked about IVC and pretty much dissed it, right? Um, so I, uh, I'm going to ask Dr. Ramesh what she thinks about that. Um, you know, is it good? Because everywhere you go, someone wants to, what's the IVC diameter? What did it do when the patient, uh, you know, took a breath? Uh, what did it do with... X, Y, and Z. So what do you think about the IVC diameter and its utility here? So yeah, I'm going to give a long-winded answer. But I just want to know from our audience, how many of you use IVC? Look at your IVC in a septic shock patient. A lot, right? Yeah. So, you know, fluids in sepsis, septic shock is, you know, an ongoing debate for multiple decades right now. Uh, fluid responsiveness basically means when you give fluid, is your stroke volume increasing or is your cardiac output increasing? So it could be 500 ml for some patients. It could be 3 liters for some patients. But again, volume overload is directly reported to be linked to mortality of patients as well. So there is a fine balance. So when you think about IVC, right, it's not useful. Um, several studies have come out. Recently, a meta-analysis came out looking at the various studies. And basically, they said the IVC diameter or the IVC collapsibility is not a very good indicator uh, for fluid responsiveness in patients. So, you know, so in my opinion, I do not use IVC solely. It's unwise to look at just the IVC and say, hey, it's collapsible, more than 50% collapsible. It's less than 21 millimeters, so I'm going to bolus this patient with fluids. It's very unwise. So use IVC in conjunction with the cardiac function, the LV function, and also the lung ultrasound, look at your lung fields, look at B lines, and then decide whether you want to give fluids. And you know, just because Dr. Greenstein looked at an uh, artificial intelligence paper, I decided to look at an artificial intelligence paper as well. So just very recently, within the last year, um, there was a paper published in the ultrasound journal, which basically looked at an AI deep learning algorithm and they you know, taught this deep learning algorithm. They showed the videos and programmed it in such a way to see, OK, this IVC is collapsible. This IVC is not collapsible. So based on that, they compared the AI's results with expert ultrasound clinicians' results, what they did, right? 
The basic conclusion was um, the AI is not good at all for volume responsiveness using IVC collapsibility or the IVC diameter. The expert clinicians did better at assessing the actual volume status of the patient. And the reason could be because clinicians have a brain, right? So clinicians are clinicians, so they look at everything else and not just the IVC, whether it's collapsing or not. So I think in this field, I don't know. I mean, IVC baseline data is not good, and you add AI on top of that, that's even worse. So no, no IVC for me. I, I, I will say, not to trash it completely, extremes can be helpful. So when I can barely find the IVC, um, that probably telling me something, and when it's two and a half, three centimeters, that's probably telling me something. And trends, I think, are always helpful. So if it comes in small and it starts getting bigger over time, um, but for that time point when you're meeting the patient and trying to answer a question, the indices just don't help. Yeah, I think, you know, looking at IVC collapsibility is really um, not helpful because really all it tells you is CVP. And what do we all think about CVP? Up. Good, not good, okay. Well, uh, not good for volume <laughs> responsiveness, right? right? It, it's a real number that has clinical implications, right. but not to use it for... It does not tell you whether a person will respond to volume or not. I guess my other question to the panelists is, um, you know, we deal with a lot of, and there's a lot of studies out there that talk about, um, you know, increased volume overload is associated with bad outcomes. So at what point in uh, assessing for giving fluids or not do you assess for volume tolerance? And how might you uh, assess for that? I think a few of you alluded to, to some of it. Uh, I'd like maybe uh, if you can give us you know, a specific example or two. Uh, so that's a very good point. Uh, so sometimes even if the patient is deemed to be volume responsive, it, you don't have to give fluids to every single patient who's volume responsive. I'm volume responsive right now. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's, uh, that's, that's that could be very true, yeah. And, um, and the reason for that is you, you may have patients with sepsis there, you would give fluids, their cardiac output goes up, and then afterwards, because of capillary leak, they will third space, and then they'll go back to their prior baseline 20, 30 minutes uh, afterwards. So it's a very valid question. And you know, uh, once we reach, in, at least in my practice, like I reach 1,500 cc's uh, of uh, a fluid total, then I really start asking the question, uh, does my patient had A line pattern and now they're developing you know, more B lines? Uh, and uh, overall, especially if someone has you know, a, a lower ejection fraction. And keep in mind that when you give pressors to a patient who's in distributive shock, Alpha, uh, pressors who work on alpha receptors may improve venous return too because it increases venous return to the, uh, to the right heart in, in some patients despite an increase to the uh, venous resistance. So uh, at least in my opinion, less fluids in uh, septic patients is, uh, in my opinion, better. Seth, comments? Well, I give diuretics to all my <laughs> patients with sepsis, so... Uh... No, I think the reason that we brought this up, I, I, I love all, all this dialogue is great, and maybe somebody out there has, a, has a, a statement. The reason we, you know, people are like, oh, here they go talking about the IVC again or whatever it is. The reason we brought this up is because it's such a controversial subject, and people are starting to believe much more in the idea of, is the patient volume tolerant? Is the patient going to accept the fluids without having something bad? Should we use vasopressors instead of fluids to just move fluids? Fluid from the unstressed volume back into the arterial system. And I think that's the reason that we're, you know, we're discussing this uh, here today. Can I say what I, what I don't do to open up a can of worms that we... Uh... Yeah, open it. So, so I don't do Vexus at this point in time. Um, and it's a really hot and sexy topic on uh, social media and a lot of conferences. Um, but it's a really cool idea. Um, and it may wind up being true, but the type of evidence that's out there right now excludes the majority of our patients, um, and it's observational. So until there's properly studied um, in a protocol, um, it's hard to actually implement that in clinical practice. Now, then again, Dr. Greenstein won't wash his hands four times if there's not evidence-based medicine <laughs> to true. say that uh, it, it, it should be there. But. Um, uh, Vexus, if it, people don't know at least, right, it's a relationship of a congestion. 
that is, is occurring in the, in the system uh, as opposed to using, you know, indices that are changing for sort of volume responsiveness. And there is some thought that down the line, hopefully, we'll be able to convince Dr. Yeah. Green. It's a, it's a really that, nice idea, but just like work. all the things we did during yeah. COVID that turned out not to pan out, we have to study things. Mm -hmm. yeah. So I'd like to, you know, invite the audience. Do you all have comments or questions uh, for our panelists? This, is, this happens every day. I, I, I am sure every single one of you has dealt with this issue and problem multiple times when you're on, you know, when you're seeing patients. So walk up. Any questions, any comments? I think it makes logical sense the questions it's trying to answer. The question is, can the clinician interpret it and acquire accurately, and does it lead to the right, you know, clinical decision and, and outcomes? So, I'm not saying that it's wrong. It just hasn't it hasn't been proven yet to be, you know, prime time. So we will leave it that vexus is vexing. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sorry. Uh, I think another audience member had a comment or a question. I have been doing echoes for the last three, four years. You know, um, I, I think it's it's slightly from the conversation. I feel it's, it's slightly blown out of proportion, because you know, with the IVC, if you have a septic patient, you know, we don't have a clear definition which patient is a fluid responsive, which, like you know, by by metrics. So you know, when you read any book on echo, you know, like you you go through all these things, looking at IVC. If suppose someone is septic. The IVC is one centimeter. They have more than 50% variation. You have done given one and a half liter. Would you give them another 500, one liter more? Yes, you will. So I think making a comment on that, that you know IVC, and also second thing is regarding vaccines. You know, hepatic when Doppler, like in the, it's it's all retrospective. Everything start with retrospective, then trials come up. Uh, you know, the hepatic when Doppler, renal when, you know, like. Everything in the congestion cascade, that's when you develop pulmonary edema. So when you're doing a lung ultrasound, there's no harm checking at the, at the you know, diastolic flow, the reversal in the hepatic vein and everything. So I think some other conversation may be blown out of proportion. I'm a, I'm a critical care fellow. We do you know, all, the, all the scans and gives you information. Okay, you know, you have this information, what you're gonna do. In practical, it's way more different when you, you know, like when you just reading the books and all this stuff and conferences, you go one and a half liter, but every patient gets three liters despite. So, you know, I, this is my observation from the conversation so far. Yeah, so, you know, I think the, the literature on IVC um, is pretty clear and comes from invasive hemodynamic measurements. We're actually looking at actual cardiac output changes. Um, and so I think we're pretty comfortable that that's not a good predictor. And you're absolutely right with um, looking at hepatic flow and uh, renal Doppler. There's plenty of literature on those things individually. The question comes down to when you package them together um, with the defined scale, does that work? And that's to be determined, hopefully, in good prospective studies. And I, I, like everything else, you know, this is a tool. Um, all of these little bits of things are tools that we have to put together in the right clinical context. Um, none of this, none of us are cardiologists, uh, at least none of us are. Um, and so we are looking at the patient in real time and making these decisions. Um, some tools are easier to obtain, easier to understand, easier to analyze, and easier to put into practice as compared to other tools. And in my opinion, the more complexity you add to your tools, acquiring it, interpreting it and then applying it, the more chances are that we are going to introduce errors, bias, and a whole bunch of other things. Um, and, that, and I'm not saying that it can't be used in the right context. It probably can. But A, we need a little more data for it. And B, we have to understand that when something is used um, across the board, we need to be able to make sure that there are standards around it that, you know, what you get is truly what you think you're getting. Uh, you know, the, the waveform that you're looking at, it should truly be what you think you're looking at. And there can definitely be issues 
uh, with VEXUS, with certainly with VTI, with other echo parameters as well. Um, and so there's, there's definitely you know, issues on both sides here. I think even for fluids, the 30 ml per kilogram for septic shock, that's a huge debate out there, right? That's another whole topic in itself. And then there's this ongoing study with the Clovers network, which basically looks at whether you give pressers first and then give fluids, or you give fluids first and then give pressers. So hopefully next year by chest by meeting, the results will come out and we can talk about that. But yeah, 30 ml is not for everyone. Yeah, exactly. You, took ev you take everything into consideration, right? Yeah. Well, I, I just be careful saying that. Uh, I, don't, I don't necessarily restrict my volume because I see a beeline pattern because the beeline pattern may not be pulmonary edema, right? Just like we saw in the case before, your patient may have pneumonia or, you know, interstitial COVID, yeah. COVID right? Yeah. And the patient needs volume. I think that, the, the, and this is the, the old person in me talking at this point, right? Like a long time ago, we said one thing. Now, now I'm an old person. So I can say, you know, uh, the concept of volume responsiveness just isn't like that much to me anymore. Right. Right. If I go down, you know, and I see a patient in the ICU and they're on like 30 mics of norepinephrine, I'm, I'm not going to ever ask, is this patient volume responsive? There's no way I'm giving this patient 500 mLs of volume and they're not going to be on 40 mics of norepinephrine anymore. They're going to be on the same exact amount of norepinephrine. Now, maybe if you have someone that you go see and they're like on three mics of norepinephrine and you can say to yourself, well, maybe if I give them just like, you know, another 500 mLs, you know, they'll be off pressers and maybe I guess it's better to be off pressers than on pressers in that type of a scenario, yeah. then maybe it's worth it to assess a little bit. Usually that just gives push. you enough time to go smoke a cigarette someplace a or a volume push, and then you come you know back. I mean? but, and, but the question yeah. of like what, like volume, like if, and all these amounts of volumes that we're talking about, uh, if you actually would look at like uh, like the summary in Epic or something, by tomorrow they'll already get that volume. But tell me if the patient changed. Right? Yeah. That's the question. And, and I think that's why we chose this topic. It's because in and I think for me at least, I really have moved towards: Are we doing more harm by giving volume to people? Are they fluid respond uh, fluid tolerant? And I think more and more physiology points to the idea that you can shift a lot of their volume outside from the unstressed volume back into their stressed volume. We'll see what happens. Uh, we need to go on to case three. Um, this is something that's near and dear to pun my heart. Uh, this is a 40-year-old uh, admitted with severe pneumonia requiring endotracheal intubation. And the resident performed a bedside echo, which in and of itself is great. Like this is happening more and more and more when people are coming to give us you know, assessments on patients, and you get an urgent call that this patient is an RV failure, and we need to give the patient TPA, right? And so, so there's a couple of things that are, you know, interesting about it and um, uh, that, that we're going to go over, but, you know, clearly this is a terrible looking uh, echo here, right? You can't really see anything that's going on, but, but the RV might be big. There's a huge coronary sinus, Right? And so even if you saw nothing else, you might say to yourself as a basic or more advanced echocardiographer, I'm going to pay attention to this on some of my other you know, views. And you know, this is the only real other view you need at the moment. I mean, this is a very large, right? It's bigger than the left ventricle. So this is severe enlargement. There's septal dyskinesis. So there's, there's a problem uh, there. You have a small left ventricle and an underfilled left atrium. And so the real question is two, right? One, why did this happen? Is it acute? Is it acute on chronic? Is it chronic? And does everything that has a big RV need uh, TPA? And the second part that our panel is going to talk about is, well, you can have a bad RV and be perfectly compensated. Does that necessarily mean you need to do something? Or is the RV failing, right? RV failure versus RV dysfunction.
And so how are we going to start okay, this out so here? So I think uh, I'm going to ask Dr. Greenstein, um, what would your approach be? How would you talk to your resident or your learner at the bedside and um, try and walk them through uh, whether this is RV failure or RV dysfunction? So you know, I would start out by saying that it's a difficult question to answer um, and would go beyond the scope of um, basic goal-directed echo for the most part, unless you had a normal echo recently and then all of a sudden a giant RV and a clinical picture that's consistent. But um, the clinical picture is really important, right? What's the patient's blood pressure? What are their hemodynamics? Um, do they look like they're in RV failure? They look pretty stable. Um, and then um, there's many different things that we can assess and measure, and the RV is kind of a pain in the neck um, to assess compared to the LV. Um, so here um, is a screenshot I took from the American Society of Echo statement on assessment of the right heart in adults. Um, so I would urge everybody who's getting into this to, to review it. It's one of those, you know, pretty uh, long ASE articles that takes a while to get through and is very exciting. Um, You'll need some coffee. Yes. Mm. Yeah. Um, and some norepinephrine, probably. <laughs> um, but, you know, some of the things that I tend to look at would be um, the TAPSI, um, the S prime, um, the septal kinetics, as Seth pointed out on that, where there was some flattening there, um, and the size. And then I really start to ask the question, um, is this having any consequence to left ventricular function? Um, and I need to assess cardiac output of the left ventricle. Uh, which you can easily do with, uh, with echocardiography. So that would be how I would think about it. If I had signs of significant RV dysfunction coupled with an LV that has a reduced cardiac output, um, that's when I would start to kind of put this together into more of an RV failure rather than um, RV dysfunction. So how would you, so you're, you're suggesting that um, we measure something to measure the cardiac output? So how would well, you do that? I mean, so my, my basic RV assessment is looking at TAPSI, looking at the S prime velocity, getting a sense of the size of the ventricle compared to the left, um, looking at the um, septal kinetics and the four chamber view and also in the short axis view, and then um, apical five chamber view um, or three chamber and doing an LVOT, a VTI measurement. Um, coupled with the diameter and calculating cardiac output. So, so if, if I could comment, then I just want to make sure that I understand and, you know, that the audience sort of gets what you're saying is that it's not that we can't decide by our eyeballs whether a person who's in shock has a DVT, you look at their heart and they have a blown, large, hypokinetic looking RV. You can say this is likely RV failure. In fact, you better say that, and you better do something that is institutionally appropriate, right? And when we, I give thrombolytics, you may take the patient and do something else. I don't think we're trying to say that you can never decide whether you're in, in you know, the RV has failed. I think what we're going to, and hopefully the panel is going to talk about a little, is that it's not always so obvious. We might see somebody with a decently large PE and RV dysfunction who's talking to us. And people get very nervous, oh, the RV's failed. Well, is the RV failed? Right, so uh, are we going to continue this so conversation? I think, so actually, I think what I'm going to ask the next uh, panelist is, here, you know, the resident did the POCUS, uh, someone kind of got some views. Uh, this is happening more and more often, uh, residents, fellows, medical students. Um, so how easy or difficult um, is it to get these views and to actually assess the RV? Um, how much training do we need? So just, uh, are, we any, are we any good at this? If you go back to that prior slide, yep. um, I forgot, I this is also in the ASE paper, and this is a good thing to look at. This is what the RV can look like depending on uh, how you're imaging in, short ac in, uh, in your access. So you can interpret the RV to be dramatically different based on off-axis views, and people sometimes don't really realize that. Yeah, and that's great. So this is exactly what, what we're dealing with, right? So how do we know um, how much training is enough? And uh, are we actually getting the, the information correctly uh, most of the time? So Dr. Ramesh, what do you think about that? Sure, so I can talk about this study. I was um, happy to be part of the study. So this was basically- So not biased at all? Not biased, not 100% <laughs> biased. I have my other f colleague here too, so we are not biased, but. Um, so basically the feasibility of trainees to perform a point of care echo to look at RV size and function 
Uh, so this, this was basically in confirmed PE patients, right? So it's not use it, you, know, you don't use it to diagnose PE, it's confirmed PE. When we... If you need to point this to oh, I'm okay. okay. Yeah, thank you. So, yeah, so basically the patient had confirmed PE and our question was, is that what's going on with the right ventricle? We care about the right ventricle a lot in PE. So the fellows were basic training with three-day point of care ultrasound and every PE patient had a pulmonary consult and every uh, one of those PEs had a point of care uh, echo done by a fellow. And uh, the RV size and function were both looked at and RV function, as uh, Dr. Greenstein had mentioned, we, the, because it's a fellow level, it's mostly eyeball, looking at the TAPSI, not looking at very hi-fi things. It's, TAPSI was our main thing that we used for, for this. And the RV size um, was also assessed by the fellows. Again, the RV is not geometric. It doesn't have a specific shape. There is no one view that will give you a good RV size or function. So we did uh, assess the RV in the peristernal short axis, apical four, uh, subcostal, short, long axis. And what's the gold standard? So comparison was with trained um, expert faculty who did point of care ultrasound and were considered uh, national experts. And when you look at the area under the curve for prediction of RV size, uh, whether the RV was dilated or not, the area under the curve for the fellows was 0.83, which is pretty good. Um, and the slide there again, when you look at the RV systolic function too, it was 0.83, almost similar to the experienced faculty. Um, does anybody want to guess how long it took for the actual official echocardiogram to be done for, this pa for these patients, just an average median time to official transthoracic echo? Exactly, you read the paper, so. <laughs> yeah, so it was 21 hours. So what could have happened to the patient in those 21 hours while you're waiting for an echo to happen, right? So this was basically um, a feasibility study to say it is possible for trainees to perform point of care echo and help to triage patients so appropriate treatment decisions can be made as a team. And this was also in conjunction when the PERT team was being developed. So again, it's helpful to get the opinion of the, your other colleagues based on how you decide, you know, how severe is the RV dysfunction, you ask for help. The more severe, then you get your whole team involved. I think the one thing to keep in mind in all of this is you can get a lot of images. People will send you images. You'll get a text. You'll get a video. In order to make decisions on it, you really need to be able to trust those images and videos. And anyone who's been doing this any length of time knows that you can make the RV look really pretty much any size. And so you really got to be careful, uh, like Dr. Greenstein was saying. Um, I think kind of a related thing, uh, Dr. Al Husseini, uh, one of the things that comes up, uh, especially when dealing with the RV is, you know, is this an acute process or is this a chronic process? Did this just happen? Uh, are there ways to tell? Um, or, you know, can we look at something on either clinically or on the echo to help us make a, a decision about whether something's acute or not? Yeah, so this is a, can be a very tricky question to answer. There are some parameters on echo that may help you answer that question. So um, essentially in patients with chronic pulmonary hypertension or uh, chronic RV disease, uh, they may develop increased RV thickness. Normal thickness of, is around four millimeters. If it's uh, more than seven, it suggests chronicity. Less than seven, it may be acute. Keep in mind though that there is literature out there that uh, describes that the RV gets thickened rather quickly and that was in uh, ARDS population within like uh, a day and a half or two. Uh, another thing that you can, you know, uh, take a look at if you see uh, a dilated RV on, on echo, you look clinically at the patient. If there is, you know, if they're not tachycardic, they look compensated, uh, that points more towards a uh, chronic process. Uh, a third parameter that, I, uh, that you can take a look at too is uh, the right ventricular systolic pressure. So we know that the RV cannot handle afterload like the left ventricle, and an acute change in afterload uh, can cause significant hemodynamic uh, compromise. So if you have a patient that you're doing a right heart cath on or you have RVSP measurements on echo as long as your measurement is accurate and you see that the RVSP is uh, above 60 and the patient is in a compensated state, that really points towards a more uh, chronic process rather than an acute process. And uh, on the flip side, if the RVSP is uh, low or less than 60 but still uh, elevated, 
uh, then you may think this is more uh, of an acute process. This is not 100% you know, um, accurate, but um, it's one of the parameters that, uh, that you can use. And uh, one of the things that, yeah. So I guess the question is, so this is another thing that, that at least I, I hear a lot. Um, oh, this person's RV is, is dilated and uh, this person has a PE. Um, you know, that, that's the only thing that, that we jump to. So how common or uncommon is it to see RV dysfunction or even failure due to other causes, especially in the critically ill population? So this is also a very good question. And uh, many times I get a phone call from the fellow that I had a patient with uh, cardiac arrest. I did an echo. I saw a dilated RV. We gave TPA. We sent the patient for a CTA and there's no PE. We treated it. And we know that's probably not accurate because, you know, TPA doesn't work that quickly. Uh, and uh, essentially, the take-home message is not every dilated RV is uh, from a, a PE per se. Uh, if you want to make a diagnosis of uh, PE because of a, you know, you see a dilated RV, just like Seth mentioned, you have to see a clot somewhere and put, you know, A plus B together. You see a, a clot in transit. But there are many causes that can cause dilated RV. Uh, patients with sepsis, septic shock, can develop uh, septic cardiomyopathy that uh, usually affects the right ventricle. Patients with ARDS very commonly uh, develop uh, RV dysfunction. This is not uncommon. That's why we, I tend to do uh, echoes on patients with ARDS every day to look for this. Uh, patients who are mechanical ventilation, also with ARDS, especially when you're titrating PEEP and sometimes just looking at your driving pressure and being happy that you're dropping it, but at the same time, the patient goes from being normotensive to having, you know, uh, being on two pressers. So you're not really uh, taking into account RV dysfunction that, that may happen with excessive PEEP. Uh, sometimes post-cardiac arrest patients might have uh, RV dysfunction. And... Um, um, if you work in a cardiovascular ICU when uh, you place an LVAD in a patient and they become hemodynamically unstable shortly after, usually the anesthesiologist will catch that on a TEE, but you may have uh, you know, RV dysfunction and failure post uh, LVAD placement. Uh, there are some other causes like if um, you drain a pericardial effusion in someone with a significant uh, RV, dis uh, RV failure at baseline and significant pulmonary hypertension, the RV might dilate. You might not catch that initially and it would dilate post uh, pericardial synthesis and they might become more hemodynamically unstable afterwards. So I think what you're saying is, um, and I think this is why we brought it up, is that everybody knows that if they see a big, a big massive RV and a clot in somebody who was perfectly fine before, that's easy. But taking the, take that away for a moment, COVID was a wonderful example for us. It was terrible, but a wonderful example to show what happens to the right ventricle. So many right ventricles failed in the face of COVID, not necessarily because of acute, big, large thromboembolic events, simply because the right side had a tough time pushing blood through the rest of the lungs. And that acute core pulmonale we saw, and it's indistinguishable from acute RV dysfunction from a PE. This McConnell sign can be seen absolutely all the time from anything that causes acute uh, RV dysfunction. So um, I guess to wrap up, um, what do the panelists sort of think about, again, uh, we talked a little bit about RV dysfunction versus failure and kind of looking at the LV and the cardiac output. Any other thoughts on that? On at the bedside, um, what can potentially help us uh, in those scenarios? Vexus. I'm just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> I, I was going to say clearly a swan gans catheter. Yeah. <laughs> Passive leg raising. Okay. Uh -huh. <laughs> How about our audience? So comments or questions uh, for our panelists around But I would, I would say that I, I thought one, someone was going to say, I would say remember though, RV failure is the inability for the right ventricle to pump enough blood to the left ventricle to, to give you your cardiac output. RV dysfunction is everything else when you look at the RV. And so one will lead into the other, but just because you have RV dysfunction doesn't necessarily mean that the cause of your shock or whatever is going on is directly related to that right ventricle. And I think that that's an important part. It's, it's kind of the same thing with when you have a patient with chronic systolic dysfunction and they could be walking around with and not being in shock, kind of like the same thing with RV. Right. I think uh, our audience member had a comment or question. Hello, my name is Kuldeep Kush, ID fellow with Chester. 
Uh, I just wanted to know, like, is there any role of looking at right atrium or tricuspid regurg for RV uh, chronicity or acute, uh, acuteness of RV failure or dysfunction? Yes, yeah, so that was an Ibrahim had um, touched on this. So in general, if your um, RVSP, PSP is very high and the patient's alive, then that's going to be suggesting chronicity. And so 60 is one of those cutoffs that a lot of people like. Um, and you were telling me, and actually I see uh, my, my fellow uh, Richa in the back who gave a nice presentation and went over the 60 and 60 rule, which I actually hadn't heard of the rule before, but it's um, the concept that if your um, RVSP is less than 60, and your mean um, pulmonary artery acceleration time, uh, which we measure in the short axis view, um, is less than 60, that that would speak to um, chronicity. I think he also is though saying it, it is true, just like on the left side, uh, with, with hypertension, your left atrium gets bigger, and chronic right ventricular dysfunction, your right atrium is going to get bigger. So if you see a normal size right atrium in a person with a PA systolic pressure of 50 and a not very thick wall, you're likely dealing with much more of an acute process. And did you say you're an infectious disease guy? I love it. <laughs> uh, any, other any other comments? So it's interesting. So those patients might have had some stuttering PEs along the way, and then you fix it and it comes back down, all the way back down. So I don't know about the 60-60 rule myself. I don't know what data is behind it, I think. Um, but I think that I, what I think your great point is, again, we must constantly use the clinical situation at hand. We know an RV cannot pump more than 60 millimeters of mercury acutely. So if you had somebody who had 70, 80, 90, 100, even though it went back to normal afterwards, that suggests that it was a subacute problem because the RV can, can really uh, accommodate over days. It just can't happen like that. And the 60-60 the rule is real. Cardiologists agree. Oh, no, I didn't too. say it was not no, real. I'm, I'm just saying, saying. I think that the more importantly to that question is that, right, the RV is extremely dynamic and patients are coming in to the hospital and getting an echo, like a formal echo, let's say, when they're completely volume overloaded, right, on their initial presentation on day one, they get an echo, right, and they have very high right sided pressures. Then no one bothers to get an echo when they send the patient home from the hospital, right, and then the you know, right sided pressures have gone down significantly, right? So there's always a combination, something like that. Then you saw that patient that had you know, very high right sided pressure, then they had a pulmonary embolism, but then they also got diuresed, you know, then the right sided pressure got better, and then you also treated a PE, so then maybe the pressures went down even further. So right. I really think there's a lot of early echo in the hospital, but very often there's not late echo in the hospital, so you really don't know what the patient's baseline status is. We see sick patients. We see this a lot with patients who have like sickle cell, and they have right all over the chart, pulmonary hypertension, mm -hmm. pulmonary hypertension. Yeah, they had pulmonary hypertension when, when they they're in an crisis. exchange transfusion, yeah, yeah, yeah. and they were crisis, and yeah. they had like a McConnell sign, right? They had right. pulmonary hypertension. Then you fix them. Then they didn't have pulmonary hypertension anymore yeah. when they went home. So uh, take it with a grain of salt. Excellent. Well, thank you so much for uh, participating and kind of uh, making this a more enriching experience. Hopefully, you all had fun, and hopefully, we answered some questions and didn't confuse you uh, even more. Uh, but please, uh, you know, please feel free to evaluate and leave some feedback on how we can improve this. And thank you, everyone, for coming. <laughs>